What's up everybody, this is Matt from Headwaters Adventure and the video you're about to watch is what I've been doing fly fish, you know, fishing on the lower Sacramento River and this can be applied to most rivers uh, around the California area. They're good tips to try on any of your home water. Uh, it's an hour long but we go over uh, mainly pulling plugs, uh, spinners and spoons, and then fishing flies, whether that be with a fly rod or the abomination that makes fly fishermen cry. I've got a fly rod with a spinning reel on it, which works incredibly well. Or if you're just doing a regular standard spinning rod and drifting flies with a bobber that way. So all are viable options. All are gonna be a great way for you guys to start catching fish on your own waters. But check it out. And if you have any other questions, uh, leave it in the comments and we'll get back to you when we can. And hopefully you're out there catching a bunch of fish. Enjoy. Well, cool. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm um, stoked to have so many people here. Uh, just to get started, I know a lot of you guys do live around here and already fish the river, but I did want to talk about the regulations. Uh, so, for the lower sack, which is basically between Keswick, oh, uh, the part that I've been fishing is mostly between Keswick and 44. And uh, in that area, it is uh, 600 feet below the dam. It's closed from April 1st to July 31st. The rest of the year, it's barbless. You can use bait, you can use treble hooks, you can use jerk baits. You can get away with anything as long as it's barbless. Um, 40, below 44, it's year-round barbless. And uh, to shoot some blows, free game, you can use barbs, bait, whatever you want. It's pretty open. And there's fish all through the system. The trout go down incredibly far. Um, you could also, uh, as if you're keeping fish, so there are trout and steelhead. Everything in here over 16 inches is technically a steelhead, whether it's gone to the ocean or not. And you actually are allowed to keep two. In the years that I've been fishing this, I've not caught one clip fish in this area. So I don't know how tangible it actually is if you're looking to eat the fish, but they're all wild natural native fish, which is really cool. Um, what I've been doing, there's been a lot of different setups. I've kind of got this abomination here, which makes fly fishermen cry. Uh, the five year off the spin again, uh, which works really, really well. Uh, but I've been doing, uh, I started just flipping spinners. And anybody who's trout fish knows spinners catch fish. Um, as far as spinners go, I have played with the single hooks as well as the treble hooks. So the siwash hooks, if you change them out, if you hook something with this, you're pretty much not losing it. Versus a treble hook, if they slap at it, they kind of get the skin of the lip. And if you get a good fish in that current, they're likely to pull off so the single hook if they eat it they don't come off um, as far as where or why to fish these they cover water so i don't think it's the most productive technique but on if you have cloudy days or cooler days or just days where you've got a short amount of time and you want to fish quickly and hit the spots where you're like there should be a fish there there should be a fish there spinner's a good way to do it just because on a day like this you're not going to have a lot of hashes, hatches. It's cooler today. I think it, it was like 65 degrees, give or take today. Um, but in the morning, the afternoon, without uh, much sunlight on the water, the bugs aren't going to come up. So having something for them to chase is going to be the next best thing, whether that be spoons or spinners. The downside to spinners is that if you're casting into a seam, if you have something that there should be a fish here, there's a rock, there's an eddy behind it, something like that, you throw it in, you're in the strike zone for about three or four seconds when you pull it through. After that, your fish either needs to be aggressive or have eaten it already. Because after you pull it out of that strike zone, they have to really, really want it to come and get it. So that's the downside to the spinner is if you don't have aggressive fish, not the best tactic. It's just pulled away from them too quickly to, to get bit reliably. Uh, I will say that if you're going to fish spinners, best thing if you want is to keep it simple. Silver and gold, sunny, silver, overcast, gold. It's the easiest way to do it. If it's not working, change things up. I really do like the um, rainbow trout colored spinners too. Something with a little bit of blue, green, pink in it. That gets eaten really good. And then on the overcast days, if it's something where the gold's not getting it done, I really like the bright colors, like the bright yellow with the red spots on it. Just something to catch their attention. It's on an overcast day where it's not gonna be shining, where they're gonna see it from further away, that more, I guess, dim color or a bold color is gonna be seen better than something that tries to be flashy. Uh, as far as the sizes, these fish, so this is a size two, 
and that's you know a decent sized spinner but I would actually use up to a three or four uh, well in this blue fox everybody's sizes are rated differently but I'd use up to a three or four in the river because the trout can get big I think the biggest one that I caught was around 24 inches and very very stout but they're big fish they could take that bigger meal very easy uh, I've been doing really good on the size 6 in the Panther Martin. Panther Martin's my go-to. If I had one spinner, it would be the Panther Martin. They seem to be able to be fished at the slowest speeds, so you could really reel it slow, but you feel the blade going. And it could just be me, but I feel like that spinner is my favorite by far. Um, the other thing that I'm doing, so again, when I first started doing this, I've been a lure guy forever. I didn't start fly fishing until I've been up here, and I've been doing some regular fly fishing, some like this, some flies on spinning rods. But once I wasn't catching as many fish as I wanted on the spinners, I started looking at the plugs. And I've been running a lot of hot shots and quite a few different colors to try and figure out what works best. Um, what I started with, uh, the pictures coming up with the pike minnow, you can see it really well, is the size 70, which is the smallest one they make because I thought, again, trout, small offerings, being a bass guy, downsize your baits. But uh, I've been throwing, this one is what I started with, and I caught so many 20-inch fish on it, it's ridiculous. And that was just starting out with the treble hook. Uh, with the treble hook, I also did lose a lot of fish, because if you don't have a fish that actually eats this, you don't get a good hookup. If they slap at it, again, you'll skin hook them. If they're just in the, the corner of the lip or just barely skin hooked, as soon as they turn down river and run with all the pressure of the water and all the pressure uh, from the force of the fish, just being on skin, it rips out. Like there's no, no other way around it. If they're not hooked in the corner, like you'll see that pike minnow where it has all three hooks right in the side, or if it has the hooks in the bottom, there's very low chance of landing it. The fish are so strong and the river's moving so quick. So something like this, uh, where I've got chains on this to the hook, a lot of fish, if you've trout fished a lot, they swipe. They'll come up behind it, check it out, and swipe at it. This, I have hooked so many fish in the mouth. I actually, somebody at the bait shop told me to start doing this. I didn't really believe it. I thought that's too far back from the bait that they're not going to get in the hook. And I have got them either under the chin or back in the roof of the mouth more times than not with this. When I've hooked them on this, they pull off quite a bit less often and I've also noticed that if I get bumped and I leave it out there if they don't hook up I'll get bumped again and usually hook up on it. With something like this too I'm leaving the rod in the rod holder so I'm fishing out of a Hobie which I'm going to talk more about the kayaks later but I'm in the, uh, the Hobie Outback and you could do this in any uh, even a paddling kayak but I cast it out I let 30 40 yards of line out uh, I'll use a bobber stop to kind of measure where I like my line usually it's around 40 feet 40 yard 40 feet uh, because you want to get down, but if you have that line too far out, uh, you'll get a big bow in your line and won't hook up at quite as much. You want to have that kind of mid-range. Uh, but with that being said, the fish hook themselves. Again, these are barbless hooks. Everything's barbless. So when you get a bite, let the fish do the work. Pick it up, put pressure on it, but don't set the hook and don't just leave it alone. You need to pick it up, get it out of the rod holder, keep reeling. Uh, but that's it. I mean, so once they're hooked, with the water pressure, if they start running up river, they've got so much pressure on that line as the hook stays pinned really well, whether you have upward pressure on them or not. And you always want to keep that there, but if they make a sprint and you can't quite catch up to them, as long as they're going up river, they stay pinned really well. Again, as far as colors go, I've got my silver and gold. Those are my go-to. If I had to pick two, that's what it would be. Uh, the other one, actually, I'd probably say this is my go-to. So this is gold, green, and red. I don't know why they eat it, but this has been uh, my most productive color besides the silver on the river. Um, it's good bait because it has the silver, green, and red, and it's very flashy. It's metallic, so it still works on the sunny days, and it still works on the overcast days. I, this would be my go-to if I had to pick one. Uh, the other thing, if it's a sunny day and that's not doing it and the silver's not doing it, I'll go to a more natural color. And this one's actually a little brown trout color. And if they just don't seem to be hitting the flashy stuff, I'll go to something a little bit more natural. It's still putting out the vibration. They can still come find it with their lateral lines. But once they see it, it's not obnoxious. It looks a little bit more real. And I'll hook up on it pretty well. So those are all hot shots, and that's in the... Uh, the size 50s and the size 70s. The other one that I'll use out here is the Maglec. And this one's actually meant to be fished a little bit slower. So uh, as when the river was high and moving faster, hot shots all the way. That's all I was doing. As soon as it started dropping, 
the bites started dropping. Also, the hot shots would dig a little deeper and I was catching grass on the bottom where they were getting stuck in rocks. So I moved over to the maglet because it's fished a little bit slower and it doesn't go quite as deep. And that kept that bite going for a little bit longer. Uh, as that bite kind of died, that's when I started switching over to the flies and bait. Uh, I do want to say too, Hot Shots makes bigger sizes than this. And as far as the regulations are concerned, they, uh, Fish and Game doesn't want to see you out here using anything too big, whether it's spinners or Hot Shots or Quick Fish, things like that, because they don't want you targeting salmon. And it, it, you want to keep it in that size range, like mid-size and down. If they see you out there throwing anything too big, they can't bust you for it because they'll claim you're fishing for salmon. Uh, so, as far as rods go, the hot shot rod as well as the spinner rod, I've been using pretty much the same thing. You can get by with the, uh, I, when I first started doing this, I was using all my bass rods. Being a bass guy, that's what I had. Um, but the 7.2 uh, medium is what I was doing it on and I was pulling a lot of hooks on it because there wasn't quite enough bend in it. And having, with these baits, they don't weigh too much, so you can't cast them too far. Having a little bit longer rod seemed to help. So I got by with that and it did work, but I did upgrade to the uh, 7.9 Loomis. So this one, it doesn't have a medium or a medium light action. It has uh, a rating as far as 8 to 12 pound test, which is kind of 8 to 15 or 6 to 12. Something in that range is what you want. But with a rod like this, you could see how far it bends into the blank. Uh, with my medium bass rod, it's a medium fast. It's got tip and then backbone. I was pulling a lot of hooks just because it didn't have that give. This give is pretty essential to keeping the fish pinned. Uh, I don't have too much of a problem with breaking fish off. In fact, uh, I do braid a leader on everything. Um, I use, if I'm doing spinners or plugs, I'm doing eight to 10 pound test. So the, the fish aren't line shy. If they're aggressive, they're going to chase that lure. They're gonna hit it. They're not looking at your line. Uh, when you start using the flies and bait, that's when you kind of want to watch your line size because they're actually coming in and eating it versus chasing it down and hammering it. Uh, but with something like this, it's got a good bend. You can cast the spinners very well with it. You can cast the plugs well enough with it. And with the plugs, obviously, you let line out. Stick it in a rod holder. Don't do anything else or hold it. Uh, big thing I would say is get a reel that has a good drag. If you give it a cheap reel and it doesn't have a smooth enough drag, the fish are going to beat you. Uh, when they take those long runs, if the reel can't keep up with it, you're going to lose fish. Um, I was breaking fish off uh, in the beginning, throwing some of the flies, just because you're doing it on four and six pound test. And with the drag too tight, when they turn down the river and make that run, they put a lot of pressure on your gear, especially with the stiffer rod if it doesn't absorb like something like this does. But all in all, that uh, you can get by with a medium light to medium. I would do seven foot and up uh, for the spinners. I like the 7.9. If you go too long, it kind of gets to be too much rod. Uh, but this is one that I picked up, and they're not terribly expensive. They're only 100 bucks. Um, anyways, uh, the next thing that I, I want to talk about is the, the flies. So everybody, if you live in town, you've been around here, fly fishermen day in, day out, drift boats. Everybody's fly fishing. I've seen, I'd say maybe five other people out there who are drifting, uh, doing things other than fly fishing, either pulling plugs, flipping spinners, or drifting with bait. Almost everybody's fly fishing. So that's when I started thinking, you know, they're doing something right because on the days where I was doing slow, I keep an eye on the drift boats and I watch how many fish they hook up to a catch. I try to talk to them. Uh, and I was talking to a couple of the guides and they're hooking into 15 fish on their float from, uh, from the sundial down to like Kutra's Pond or Bonneview, they're doing 15, 20 fish, not landing, but hooking. And I, on my best days with the plugs and the spinners, I was doing about six to eight fish. And that wasn't landing, that was hookups. Mm -hmm. um, so with that too, the spinners and the, the plugs, they're coming up and nailing it, slapping it, things like that. They're not eating it well. When you're doing bait or a fly, they see it coming, they open and they eat it. They think it's food. It's not something that's aggressive, it's just natural. So when you hook them on the flies, your hookup ratio is much better. You're not losing the fish. You're not skin hooking them. They're, it's in their mouth, they're pinned. You just have to, once you stick them, rely on the reel, rely on your rod. Um, so this contraption that I have here is basically the fly fishing setup. They're running, depending on the water levels, about a 10 foot leader to a seven foot leader, something around there, and three flies. They've got the small foam bobber, 
and uh, to a couple, they use the steel weights. I've kind of experimented with the steel and the lead. I don't think there's much of a big difference. With this rig, you can get by with less weight than the other indicator bobber rig that I'm going to show you. Uh, but with something like this, the hard part is obviously managing all of this line that's out. And sitting down in the kayak, if I had a fly rod, I would want this out plus another 10, 15 feet to get it away from the boat. And that's a lot of line to pick up. When you're sitting down, you're gonna be doing these big movements. With something like this, I can reel it up to the indicator, and then I've got the seven to 10 feet out, which I can then flick 10, 15 feet to the side of me very easily. Um, the fly guys are usually running two to three flies, and I'm at least doing two in this rig. I will, I will do three because you're kind of on the, the cast with this because it's so long, you're kind of laying it over and then letting it go. So the flies don't wrap, they don't go anywhere. They kind of just lay out straight, which is really nice. And you can get by with three. And the other setup, I only use two because it gets tangled constantly. It's a pain. But with this, you don't need to get it far from the kayak. 10 feet away from the kayak is plenty. A little bit upstream or sideways is great, but basically you're going to drift down the river of it, with it, and if you've been on the river, and I'm gonna talk about it later, about where to target them, seams, things like that, you really wanna keep the bobber drifting as natural as possible. The water knows where to push it, that's how it flows, that's where the fish are gonna to be to feed. So you don't want to pull it, you wanna leave it natural, you just wanna keep your kayak next to the bobber as close, well, 10, 15 feet, as close as you can without inhibiting the way it's drifting. Uh, with something like this, bobber goes down, you lift up, you don't gotta swing for the fences, they're not bass, they're itty bitty sharp little hooks. Lift up and start reeling. I keep the drag really light, I probably do it a little bit tighter than that, but not much pressure at all. Those hooks stick really well, so as soon as you start reeling down on them, and the reason that I've actually really liked this fly rod is again, it bends all the way through the rod. I have not had a fish pull off of this setup. If I hook them, they are landed, which is, really nice <laughs> um, yeah even on these little itty bitty flies oh, the majority of the fish that I'm catching are on these little flies and I don't know what size they are and I've got a lineup up here 16 looks like 16 or 14 perfect so, mm -hmm. <laughs> small flies and I've got a few that are smaller than that and I've got them up here for you guys <coughs> to check out or I can pass them around but I'm not using a bunch of different patterns. And the really nice thing is, if you're gonna be using flies, whether you're doing it, something like this, a fly rod or a spinning rod, go to the fly shop. Everybody there is incredibly friendly, and they've got a uh, whiteboard up there that shows, or tells you what bugs they're catching them on, which is really nice. And I haven't got to, basically I go in there, what's working? They say this, I pick it up, and it works. Uh, they've been pretty spot on with all their information that they've given me, which, is a lot coming from bait shop and other fishermen who like to keep their stuff secret. Um, I will say as far as tying this rig goes, one of the other things that I have experimented with, and you'll have people do it in a few different ways, is how you actually tie a multiple fly rig. So the way that I was doing it at first and the way a lot of people do it, have your back fly tied to the shank of this hook so that it drifts right behind each other. And it worked, I caught fish doing that. Um, Somebody else told me to try it where you tie both pieces of line to the eye of the fly, and that has been the more productive way. For one thing, if you trust your knot, you've got two knots on the eye, it's very strong. Um, this bug is out away from the line versus it being in line, which I like, and probably just in my head, but I don't feel like they're going to eat it as good this way, where this is kind of dangling more like a drop shot would be, or a shrimp fly if you're an ocean guy. Um, the other thing that you'll want to think about when you're doing flies is you always want to have a bigger fly on top. So this is what they've been calling the attractor fly, which I originally thought was just something bright, get their attention. But any larger fly is going to be a, a good one as an attractor fly because they're going to see that, oh, what is that, and then see something small and easy next to it. And nine times out of ten, I mean, maybe even more than that, they're eating that bottom fly. You will catch them on the middle fly, but not anywhere near as much. Um, I like to throw the stone fly up top just because um, out here and doing demos and things like that, I'm out flipping rocks while people are out trying out kayaks, things like that. And I'm trying to figure out, you know, kill time, yes, help the customers, yes, but make my fishing better. Um, when you're flipping rocks, I found quite a few black stone flies, lots of black leeches too. So there's 
quite a few different insects out there. Again, I don't know all of them, but there's stoneflies and leeches, and those are going to be two of your larger presentations that you could do for a teaser fly. Oh, as far as line on this too, um, before your swivel, I'm doing 10 pound test. I also experimented with this. I had different people tell me different things. Obviously, everybody's got their own way of doing it. But uh, 10 pound test to the swivel and uh, six pound test to my flies. I won't use four, I broke too many off on four. I don't think you get bit any better on four to run the risk. The fish are too big, they're too strong. Um, the six seems to work out just fine. Uh, also too, with this bobber rig, the braided line is actually a really, really good help with this because it floats. And so you want to have your leader tied on, say 10, 12 feet and then you can adjust it from there. So you've got, you know, maybe two or three feet of fluorocarbon in the water to your braid. If you're using 20 to 30 pound braid, it floats. So you could actually mend it just like you do a fly rod because that's the big thing. If you had all uh, fluorocarbon, that line's going to sink. It's going to affect the drift of your bobber. So if you're doing monofilament or braid to leader, you have uh, a lot easier time keeping that drift correctly because you can kind of lift up that 10, 15 feet of line you have out, drop it in front and keep letting it drift. If you have too much in front, it starts pulling the bobber down and it'll actually start drifting faster. Uh, if you're going to be doing the conventional spinning rod, oh, actually another point I want to touch on with this setup, if you're using the long fly rod, get a net with a longer handle. If you've got 10 plus feet there, you're doing a lot of this trying to get your fish in and it's a huge pain. So get something that's got a little bit longer butt and it'll make life easier. I also can stand in my kayak so if I'm in a spot where it allows me to do that where I don't have any rapids coming up, I'll stand to get more height, drag it over and I can usually get it in the bucket. If you're going to be doing the more spinning rod method, this is really easy. Basically the same setup after the swivel, you're just going to do the flies. I won't do three flies with this just because, again, it gets tangled because you're actually reeling this one up and casting it. And when you cast it, they kind of flail all over. They'll get wrapped around the bobber. They'll get wrapped around each other. It's more of a pain. Two works out better. Um, with something like this, again, you want to keep your drag light. Again, you're not casting far from the boat. You're really flipping it out 10, 15 feet. There's not much you have to do. Um, but you do want to get a slip bobber, something that slides, and that's how your depth is going to be adjusted. That's why it's so much easier to cast it with the smaller rod. It's also easier to land the fish without the long net. Uh, again, you're going to do it to about 7 to 10 feet, depending on where you're fishing. So it's very, very easy to adjust, just like that. And now you're in the strike zone when, you, when your weight drops down and your bobber slides up. There are a bunch of different bobbers. If any of you have used a slip bobber before, this one's pretty cylindrical, where you have some that are more uh, tapered, more egg-shaped, where they're skinny on the bottom and wider on the top. Those ones actually have more buoyancy, they're denser. And actually, I left it at home, but that's what I've been using on the river. In the slower moving water, this one gets you by just fine. Uh, in that faster moving water and going deeper and using a little bit more weight, you want to have that one that has a little bit more buoyancy to it because if you get in a, a seam where it's got a swirl or something like that, it'll pull your bobber down and that's not a fish and you're going to set the hook and take it out of position. Um, but with this setup, you obviously want to have your, your weight uh, and you have to play with it. Um, I've just got this bulk box of split shots and I usually start with um, a couple big ones, see where it rests. The lines on these are actually where they're supposed to sit. So this bobber is supposed to sit in the water at that black line. So that's a great way to judge your weight because you want to have enough to get it down, but you also need to have enough buoyancy to where it's not sitting here the whole time. You're not going to be able to see the bites as well. If it's properly weighted, the smallest bite is going to drop that down. It's just the way they're designed, a little bite, the right weight, it goes under, set it quick. Uh, the other thing that I really like to do is I've been doing a corky at the top, which is uh, like a floating bead. A lot of people do these in front of uh, eggs and worms and things to keep them off the bottom some. Uh, but what this does is if your flies or anything get wrapped up, if, if for some reason your corky is not at the top of your bobber, something's wrong. Reel it in, check it out, recast. So that's a quick and easy way to know if it's drifting right, because if it's not drifting right, you're not going to catch anything. Uh, but besides that, uh, 
this is a medium light. Uh, any good drop shot rod will do. Something that's got a little bit of tip and a little bit of bend to it so you can keep them pinned. But more than anything, you want to have that really good drag. And I leave it light, lighter than you might think. Again, the bugs are small, a little bit of pressure, they're pinned. Let them run, let them do their own thing. If you try to force these fish to you and keep position, you're going to lose more fish than you catch. Especially if you hook into a good one, float with the fish, do what the fish wants. You're going to lose your position, you're going to go into the next hole, but you're going to land that fish. If you start trying to force them, you will lose far more than you catch. Uh, also too, the uh, bobber stops that I use, they have the long ones as well as they have, these are like the bass fishing ones, these are my punch stops. Uh, but as long as you don't have any small guides, they will cast very well through a, a standard guide rod. And they stay in place a lot better and they're easier to adjust. The uh, uh, fabric ones, the like thread ones, they seem to wear out quicker and you're constantly messing with them. These work better. This First is brand name? Uh, this one is from Six Cents, but Eagle Claw makes them. As far as cheap ones, everybody makes them. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just uh, put your line through there and you grab one of the pieces and slide it up onto your line. And uh, they work great. You will hear them going through your line. They'll go thump thump all their way through. <laughs> uh, what else? So that's pretty much as far as the rods and the. Oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. There are one more technique mm. that I've been using out there is um, uh, fishing bait, which bait's legal. If you're a trout fisherman, you know they love night crawlers. Uh, I did get a salmon earlier this year, so I uh, do have some row as well. And with the salmon right now, last time I was out, I probably saw 15, 20 salmon between swimming, jumping. Like, there's a lot in there right now, which means it's pretty flooded with eggs, which is an awesome fly to use, which I didn't mention. But uh, egg flies are really, really big uh, food source in this river. So all the fly guys will use eggs at some point in time. In fact, talking to uh, some of the uh, wildlife, uh, fish and wildlife people around here, there's actually seven runs of salmon that come up through the river, which I had no idea. I thought of spring and fall. I thought you had two. But they come up year round, so the egg pattern is always a viable option. Um, doing something like row, there's two ways that I'm gonna do it. It's going to be either a slinky weight or uh, a rubber weight, which is more of the bouncing Betty style. Um, this one, even though it looks big, this is only a quarter ounce, so this will get you down to the bottom, but it's pretty weightless. It'll kind of just bump and roll over rocks and drift very naturally. And with a presentation like that, or with the slinkies, you're usually casting upriver 20 yards, let it hit the bottom, and then just drift with it. You'll feel it come over rocks, you'll feel it bounce over, keep it out of the rocks, and then you'll feel, because if they're sitting here, it's going past them, they'll grab, and they're gonna stay in one spot or swim forward when they eat it, and you're gonna feel that distinguished thump thump versus what it, thump thump of it hitting rocks. Um, I've been playing with both the different weights. I have not found a big difference. They both stay out of snags pretty well, and that's the big thing. Uh, you do have to adjust your weights. Uh, I don't know what weight this is. Well, they sell them in 3 8 ounce, and basically what I'll do is I'll slit them open, and I'll keep a lighter in my life jacket. I'll pop one of the beads out and singe it back shut, and I'll keep doing that until I find the right weight. Or you could make them yourself as well. They're not too hard to make. Um, if you are going to be using eggs, the egg loop is the way you want to do it. So it's a, a version of a snell knot where you could actually take and you have this loop that comes off the back of the hook. You'll cut your row, you'll stick it in between here and pull it down. Not tight, just enough because you don't want to break the skein and pop the eggs off, but just enough for it to stay on there. A lot of people add a little bit of yarn, things like that, just to give it a little bit more flair. Plus, uh, like a marabou jig, you'll have a little bit more undulation when you do that. Um, the other, another great option as far as if you want to uh, duplicate eggs are these B&R soft beads, which is really, really cool. Uh, I hadn't started using these until I lived up here, but basically, just like the bobber stops, they give you this little packet, almost exactly like the bobber stops. So it's got a, a peg mm -hmm. insert, and there's a hollow spot in the eggs. So you slide it on the line the same, and then you slide the egg down the line and pin it onto the bobber stop. This keeps your bait from moving around quite so much, keeps it in place. You don't have to rebait with the row. Uh, your scent's gone fairly quickly. 
uh, especially if you keep thinking you're getting bites and trying to set the hook on rocks. Uh, but they'll fall apart. Something like this, it's very, very easy not to lose your bait. Uh, and some people will put scent on this. I tried it with a crawdad scent and egg scent. Caught fish on both. I haven't had a spectacular day on this yet, but I know this time of year is the time to have spectacular days on egg patterns. And it's just a lot less messy. With row, everything's red. I mean, the bottom of my kayak's pretty red from all the cure and stuff coming off of it. Uh, looks like a murder scene, but again, to catch fish, it works. Uh, the other option as far as drifting bait is going to be uh, night crawlers. With something like night crawlers, you do want to use more of a bait keeper style hook with the egg hooks. Um, I use the side drifting hooks. They're I mean, kind of a round bed, more like an egg hook or an octopus hook, but they don't have any of the barbs on the back to keep the bait on there. So if you have the barbs on the back, your worm will stay up there a bit better. And more often than not, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just dragging them backwards, you know, cast up river, troll, or drift down river until you get bit. Um, you do get in the bottom a lot that way though, just because your bait is on the bottom. So again, that's where you want to add something like your corgi. So if you uh, put that on your leader before you put the night crawler on, that corgi is going to keep you in the water column, but the drifting is going to keep it down. So you're going to kind of be in this mid range right in front of their face instead of it dragging along the bottom and catching a lot of grass. And the, the bait keeper hooks just keep that worm on there a little bit better. Uh, or else it slides down, it looks like a J, and that doesn't look real. <laughs> and that's legal to have the barbs on the top? Well, on the back of it like that. Right, yeah. on the shank? Yes. Right. Uh, okay. yeah, so it's just the barb in the bend of the hook that you need to curl. Oh, okay. Yeah. The other thing that I've played a bit with, so I've also drifted leeches. If you go flip rocks, you'll find leeches. Quite a few of them, and there's some that are probably three, four inches long. Um, if you do do something like that, you want to hook them in their butt, which is the larger sucker. But they come off really easy because if you're just doing that so they can wiggle, they can slide right off as well. So um, they have bait buttons, something that slips. It's a little rubber disc that slips right over the edge of the hook. If I'm doing leeches or anything that has potential to slip back like that, I'll put the bait button on and push it up so that bait stays in a more realistic position or on the hook in general. Um, for rod holder, I really just have this sitting on my kayak. These Omegas are nice because you can flip that around and you've got a spot for a spinning rod to tuck in. And I really, if I'm pulling plugs, I just sit there like that until there's a fish on and they go pretty nuts. You'll have whap, and then your line will start screaming. It's great. Uh, that's the only thing I use the rod holder for. Uh, uh, the other big thing, uh, oh, how do I pause this? on it. Perfect. So exactly what I want to talk about. Uh, as far as fishing in the river, obviously any fisherman knows they want ambush points. They want easy food. They want something to come to them. A lot of our river has stuff like this where you're going to see the more calm water and then the swirling drifting seams that go throughout the almost the entire thing. Um, the bottom contours really kind of make these seams as well as the faster current in the river and usually to both sides or to some extent there's eddies. But something like this, all of the water and all of the food and all of the currents going in one direction, that's following that seam. So when you're fishing these, you will catch fish in the middle. You'll catch fish out here, but your majority of fish are going to be right on the edge of this. So especially with bobbers, it's very easy to tell where your bait is because you're following it, uh, as well as the current's going to push that bobber in the most natural way. As long as you're not putting any uh, pressure on it or moving it yourself, it flows the way it's gonna flow very well. Um, same thing if you were going to do spinners. I do think the spinners are going to work a lot better in shallow water. Uh, so something, if you were gonna see something like this out on the river where you have a rock that comes out and you start to see um, a churning water, any sort of little white water, any ripples, uh, that's where you want to aim the spinner because if there's anybody sitting right here, as you pull past them, they're going to have a second to decide, do I want to eat this or not? So you'll get a lot of those fish to hit, where if you're casting from here across this, they're going to have more time in that seam to come check it out and decide yes or no. In a small spot like this, if they're nosed into a shallow spot, they're going to eat or they're not. Um, and that's if you're doing spinners or spoons, that's the kind of stuff I would target. They'll still eat it in there, just less frequently. They've got more time to decide. Uh, 
fishing something like this, that natural approach, whether you're, I think the bobber is probably the best way to catch fish out here. I think it's the most consistent, but if you were going to be dragging bait, you'd also want to be dragging it down the seam, as well as if you're pulling a plug. The fast water here, if you're trying to stay stationary, paddling backwards or pedaling backwards, that's where you want to be is kind of towards the inside and the edge of the seam. Over here, there's not gonna be enough water pressure for your plug to move properly. And the really nice thing about the plug is because you're back trolling, you can kind of dictate whether you wanna go a little right or a little left, but it's gonna stay in front of their faces for a long enough time where it's either gonna aggravate them or it's gonna come right next to a rock or over a small drop and they're gonna be there waiting for it and they're gonna hammer it. And when they hit the plugs, they don't play around. It's not like a tap, you're gonna know. They, they hook themselves. Not all the time. If either you're gonna have crap and nothing, or they're gonna be on. Um, so I was saying you have the direction of the current and the seams. The seams are more often than not what you want to target. You will catch them in eddies too, just because that's an easy spot for the fish to catch their breaths and relax. Most of the time, you're gonna be right on the eddy, so where your bobber will swirl into this. Now, you don't spend too much time there, because more often than not, the feeding fish are going to be in that main current in the seam, because they're gonna sit there, mouth open, and just let everything come to them. It's very easy uh, to get a meal that way. I would say the only thing that I would worry about as fishermen and fishing this river, because I know a lot of people are intimidated of the river, which obviously treat it with respect, but it's not a scary river. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> uh, but your eddies. The ocean, if, <laughs> so the eddies in here are churning water. You can see with the arrows, it's spinning around. If you have some choppy rapids, which everything that I, uh, we've got up here is basically ones and twos, if you aim right down the middle of that, you're gonna get wet, you're gonna go right through it. If you try to avoid it and get into something like this, with your boat going one direction and an eddy catching you, it'll turn you really quick and really fast, and if you're not coordinated with what your body's doing, it can put you in the water. And that's when you see most people on the river go swimming. Um, it's just something that when you do hit these, because I, I actually will aim for the eddies, but you just have to know how to treat them. I'll shoot straight into an eddy, and you expect to be hit with that sideways uh, current of water. So you'll do that, and you just kind of adjust your body to it. A lot of the people that are running the problem will feel that water movement and immediately overcompensate, and they're going to dump themselves right in. So it's something that you do want to watch out for, but it's also something that's pretty beneficial because if you're spinning around in the seti, you can hold your position incredibly well and fish through this all very efficiently. One of the other things that I really like to do to fish efficiently out here, there's plenty of shallow spots. Right off the posse garage, there's this giant rock bar there that's, I mean, that much water at some points of it. So you could pull your kayak up to that and I'll have an anchor with, you know, five, 10 feet of rope on it and anchor my kayak in the rocks while I get out and fish more thoroughly the stuff that you'd float by too quick if you stay in your kayak. There's a handful of spots on the river that you can do that to and you, it's really more efficient to do that because in the kayak, you're constantly moving down river. Even if you're backpedaling, you're not going up river. You're staying in place and forward. So getting out and fishing, if you're gonna spend the day out there, if you wanna maximize the fish that you could be catching, get out, get your feet wet, make some casts, fish through it a little bit more thoroughly and slowly. Which we'll go over some uh, water shoe options in a second. Hey Matt, so is, are you are you back trolling then a lot? For the plugs. For the plugs? Only for the plugs. Yeah, so I have the, the boat facing downstream. I've got my pedals in reverse and I'm just staying on them enough that the, the plug goes, basically. If my plug's going and I don't have to pedal at all, that's the perfect speed. If your plug starts thumping a little bit less, pedal backwards a bit. But uh, for the plugs, exclusively black, back trolling. Actually, not. Bobbers, you, you, you're not. Bobbers, I drift sideways. At all. Nope, just, uh, I'm just, just going drifting. sideways with them. I'll be facing them sometimes and drifting sideways, but I'm not back trolling with them because you just want that to float naturally. Uh, I actually do, there's a couple of spots where you have the eddies that swirl back up towards you. I will actually throw it in and troll down river through those and I have picked up fish doing that. Uh, the other <clears throat> thing that we have a lot of in this river are just depth changes. So um, after, after the Sundial Bridge, coming up on that next rapid, it goes from, I don't know, 10, 12 feet or so, up into two or three. On those inclines, which are, there are quite a few of them in the river, smaller than that, but there are lots of those, 
those fish are just going to hang out and wait for stuff to be washed over. There's also, if you launch up by the posse grounds and go straight across the river, there's uh, reds from the salmon there. There's these uh, gravel patches, and it looks like sand because they've cleared all the gravel out and the fish will hang right on the back of those because that's where the salmon spawn. So if you see salmon in there, assume there's trout, throw something in it, let it roll over the back. Uh, when one of the first really nice fish that I caught, I was doing that. I saw salmon, I saw a trout actually facing down river because going over one of those humps, they're out of the current. They're just kind of sitting and resting. And he was facing the wrong way. And I pulled off into an eddy, cast him back up, and that drifted through and immediately hooked up. So it, those little changes, they can tuck down, they don't have to use any energy, and they're just sitting there waiting for food to come by. If you see salmon in the river, throw an egg pattern, whether it be a fly or one of these rubber things or actual salmon eggs or a row. Uh, if you see salmon, one of the best things you can do, throw a salmon egg. But that's really what I'm targeting. There are also big boulders, which if you fish for anything, fish like to hide around boulders, especially in that dead water in the back, they're gonna hang out there, right next to where the food's gonna be coming by. So always, if you see boulders in the water, cast at those and you'll pick up fish. But again, more consistently than not, the seams are gonna be what does it. And obviously you have all of these options, so make use of them. If you see one, uh, see a spot, it's like, ah, there should be one there, flick it over there. If you get one, you get one. If not, go back to the seams. Um, as far as that goes, that's that's about it for uh, reading the river. Um, look for the seams, watch out for eddies, but also use them to your advantage. Oh, this is another picture I want to pull up. So something like this is not a great picture, but uh, right here is that, uh, I believe this is the gravel bar I was talking about. You can see where it's shallow all the way through here. So this is something where you can hop out and then fish this whole inside seam, and this is where the rapids come in, which again, there's gonna be fish there, they're just gonna be out of the fastest stuff, right on the side. So you can see how it funnels too. So again, something like this, where there's a depth change funneling into uh, quicker water, stuff that you wanna look at and target. Uh, all of you guys fish, all of you guys have polarized glasses, use them. I mean, if you could stand, great. If not, a lot of the river is three to five feet, and it's very clear. And you could see these depth changes. If you can't, if you see rocks and then see no rocks, obviously, try throwing something through that. Um, that spot you're talking about right there, you can wait clear out. You can. You can actually come from there. over that, here and wait yeah, through that, this that, if you want to dip a little that better. Deep, that deep everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so I start up here, <clears> float <throat> down, and I'll get my kayak close, drop an anchor so I don't lose it, and I'll walk down and up this thing if there's nobody else out there. And you usually pick up a few fish doing that where if you were only to fish it from the kayak, you're moving through it pretty quick. You might pick up one. One shot. Exactly, and if, if you hook one in the kayak right and it's a good one, you go with them. If you're on shore, you can fight them to you a little bit better than yeah. in the boat. How, how is it to go down? Just if you go past that right there. That's right where I've here? always been afraid that I don't want to go through there. Um, yeah, so like, this stuff right here. Wet, let's put it that It might get wet. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> so this stuff through here is really shallow and right. uh, quicker moving. But you could back. I, I back pedal through that because usually I'm pulling the plug through, through there for most of it. Uh, if the water keeps dropping, probably not. If you shoot straight through it, you'll be fine. The side you don't want to be on is that left side. Right it's got really big, strong eddies. Because oh, yeah. I tried actually sticking to that side and fishing down through it, and I got spun around. I got pushed in the trees. Like I was having a. Uh, I'm glad I didn't yard sale, but I was in a tight spot there. If I probably fished that area a lot right there. And I'm on this side. I watched. Or, well, no, right on that side. Okay. Out through that eddy right there. Mm -hmm. through there. But I've watched drift boats get in trouble right there. So. Yeah. So if you go straight down it where the water is actually choppy and intimidating, yeah. you'll do better than actually trying to pull out to the, that side. The right side is pretty safe. There's, uh, it's all moving, but there's no real eddy there. It's all going in one direction still. So you can get into that slower moving stuff and not have to worry about it. But if you had to take it, go straight down the, the chute. But you can't fish down the chute, so that's why I usually pull off to that slower right. side. This is probably the most hectic spot I've been in in the whole river uh, yeah. as far as where I've been fishing and that left side because I went through trying to fish it and it will get spun all around pushed into everything trying to turn the boat over um, 
interesting to see. So as far as boats go, uh, like I said, I've been using the Outback. I've also been using the new Lynx. The Lynx is awesome. This is not what it's made for. It's so flat that if you're backpedaling with it, the water actually washes onto the back of the deck and you'll actually start to get pushed under it. And some of the eddies, mm. it tipped me up on my side and I actually had to level the boat out. Yeah, and that was the first time it was a little iffy. Um, but the Outback, because of the way it's designed, you're sitting a little bit higher out of the water. It doesn't come in the back, and if it does, it splashes into the back because it hits something It comes in first. It doesn't push it down. So as long as you don't have anything too flat, you're golden. Uh, I haven't been in the Pro Angler, though I do want to take that down just to see a bigger boat, more boat to push around from the current and the eddies. You're going to catch more. Um, uh, anything with a pedal drive I think is great. If you have a prop drive, you need to watch the depth a lot more than if you're in a fin drive because the fins you can get really shallow and glide almost over almost anything. With the prop, you've got to pay a little bit more attention to your surroundings, but it still works fine, especially if you stay in the deeper parts where instead of avoiding it and trying to go shallow, you go straight through the middle of it. It's going to be a lot nicer. You can also pat, uh, use a paddle kayak. I floated in a paddle kayak. I've caught fish out of a paddle kayak. The thing that sucks about that is in so the sundial down to the next rapid, if you have a pedal drive, you could float through the good stuff and then come into the eddies, which are either swirling to pull you up or just slower water, and you can work your way back up to the sundial. So you can make that run three or four times or until you get tired or until you hook a big fish at the end that runs down and you have to go after it. In a paddling kayak, it's a little bit harder to do that or at least more work. You can do it in that section if you use the eddies and that slow moving water correctly. But with that, you're more at the whim of the fish in a paddling kayak. Because if you hook something with the pedal drive, I've got forward and reverse that I can pull. If you've got a prop drive, forward and reverse instantaneously. Um, if the fish is going down river, I let it go, I don't pedal. If it goes up river, I don't want it running up while I'm drifting down. So I'll flip it into forward and I will go chase it down, constantly keeping pressure on the fish. Left and right, I'll follow it a little bit, but you could just control that fish a little bit better with the pedal drive. If you you know, know where your uh, levers are, or forward and backwards, obviously very easy, but um, following the fish around. Because if you try to force that fish back upstream to you and are putting it to it, you're gonna pull hooks, you're gonna lose fish. I lost quite, quite a few, a lot of nice fish doing that when I was like, I want to stay in this hole, I don't want to go down there yet, I'm going to try and get this fish to me, you'll lose them. So if you want to land them, go with them. If they're going upstream, great, follow them. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the best things that I think you could do if you've got a buddy is a two-person kayak, because you could have one guy paddling, just like the guys on the drift boats have one guy on the oars. You could have your buddy paddling while you fish through a stretch, and then you could trade and also fish through a stretch, and it'd be a good way to do it if you don't have pedals. Or depending, again, on how much work you want to put into it. Um, Besides that, I mean, the last thing is kind of clothing and safety. Always wear your life jacket. The river's cold. It's 55 degrees, give or take, year round. Whether it's 55 degrees outside or 105 degrees outside, the river, it all comes from the bottom of Lake Shasta, and it stays chilly, which on a summer day, jumping in, getting back, great. It's still cold. It's still cold. I don't swim in it. I, I cool off. I get back out. Uh, but the, uh, the river, it's very cold. So... The weather that we have now, what I'm doing is still quick dry clothes. It's not cold enough to where I'm doing any dry suits yet. As it cools off, a lot of times I'll do like hiking pants, quick dry uh, material. But also uh, a lot of companies, they have thermals that they make that aren't wool. That are actually like, uh, quick dry acrylic synthetic material. Mm -hmm. And because it dries fast, if I get it wet and I'm out in the sun when it's still cool out, it dries and it also keeps me warm. Once it starts getting... I don't know, under 60, maybe in the mid 50s, that's when you want to start doing either dry gear, which something like this is the um, NRS dry boot. Uh, dry up to here. You go any further than that, water gets in. Besides that, it is completely dry and it's insulated. And if you do something like that, when it gets really cool, cold, I'll do wool socks or something of the sort if I'm out there and it's really, really cold. But the other good thing to look into if you want to be on the river year round is something like a set of dry pants. So this have Velcro pull tabs so you can get this real tight around your waist. If you fall in the water, you might get a drip in. It's not something where you're going to freeze right away or get completely soaked. The other thing that's nice about this is it's built with booties in it. So even if you don't have a completely dry shoe, if you use something like this, what I'll do again, if it's really cold, I'll put a wool sock on on the inside of this, slide your shoe over, you're completely dry, you're insulated, and you can walk all the way up to your waist to get in and out of the boat if you still want to wade fish without having waders or anything of that sort. 
There are quite a few options. There are full dry suits. You could do wet suits. Just something that ins insulates you if you do go in the water. I mean, if you were to go in the water and get away from your boat when it's cold out, if the weather's cold, the water's cold, that's a disaster waiting to happen because you will stiffen up real quick and if you don't have somebody there with you, it could be dangerous. And I do a lot of my fishing by myself, so you want to be prepared for what happens. Um, I've been using those pants for, I don't even wear my waders anymore. I wear just those. Yeah, they look great and they're breathable. A lot of them are Gore-Tex. Great. great. Yeah, and Coquitat's got a lifetime warranty, so we always recommend those because you put a hole in it, you get them fixed. Um, I was saying about this earlier, which I have not used these a lot, but these siped shoes from Astral is what I've been using most uh, in the river here and up on the upper sack. Even on slippery rocks, stuff with algae on it, these stay gripped. I don't know how it works, but they're sticky. They're sticky shoes. I really like them because I used uh, old tennis shoes before to wade in or old boots. And when you're standing on a rock that's slick, if it starts to slide, you'll jam your toes right in with a pair of uh, like tennis shoes. It's not, not nice. Uh, always wear your life jacket, always stay hydrated, uh, I don't know, that's about it, really. Um, and besides that, do you have any questions? Where get those boots at? We've got them here. No, not those, the other ones. These? Yeah. We've got them here. You got those here too? Uh, that, this is the only size I have in this color, but yes, we have them here. I don't care what color they are. Okay. I'm not going with fashion show. Yeah, not yet. What's your trick to keeping your, the salmon off your line and stealing all your three flies? You don't. You don't. <laughs> so, you, no trick. Yeah. so you get prepared to, to lose some tackle. You know, so... You could bring those salmon in pretty easy. To what we fish for, but it's like, we hit, if it doesn't go, <coughs> you're like, ah, shit. And you just reel them in. So I just turned down the stream on me and it was like one flick of the tail and it was bye bye. Well, when we, because we went uh, with. We had like, ben. I had like four, don't yeah. use four. Oh, I six. had like four or six pound tennis on my bottom fly and he grabbed that. Yeah, so I, I saved my top yeah. one, but. So if you do six, you don't break off nearly as much. Mm -hmm. um, have you I landed know. any salmon and have, get your fly so, back? So technically you're technically actually supposed, you're supposed to, to break, break them off. Break them uh, off. But I hooked, right. I hooked them on the plugs. Okay. And uh, I was I, I had landed probably a 12 pound salmon, but I was able to, once I knew it was a salmon, I got over into an eddy, pulled my boat out on shore, fought to, and then took it out of the water, right. shut the hook off. And oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I've hooked a few, most of them I try to let them shake off. I'll shake them off. And they do shake off. Oh, they do? Sometimes. So it's all barbless stuff. Right. I've only to had to land right. one. I've been broken off by others, and I've had others just come off. Uh, but yeah. I've also hooked plenty of trout where I was like, damn it, it's a salmon. And then I'll see it jump. I was like, I don't know if that's a salmon. I've had three or four trout that I was convinced were salmon until I saw them, wow. which is awesome because the trout here are just bruisers. Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that I got uh, out here most recently was probably pushing eight pounds, probably 24 inches, built like a brick Jeez. with a little tail on the end. Um, that thing, uh, in most of the 20-ish inches that you take, they'll take 30, 40 yards immediately. You'll set the hook and <laughs> That one did it like five times. Wow. <laughs> they're absolutely, they're gorgeous. Oh, fish. and they're so strong. Yeah, any other questions? I mean, I, I got hooks. I don't know if you guys want to see anything. I can pass around some of the, the hooks that I have. Can you pass that hot shot with the chain on it? Yeah. So uh, where does light chain? bait legal? What was that? Where is light bait legal from where to where? Uh, all through it. The whole. Just the whole. barbless. Okay. Yep. Just gotta be barbless. So yeah, the chains, and I've actually been yeah, using a these. couple different chains. So. Are these pre-cut chains, or you cut them in the lane? No, they sell at the base store. Uh, and so like this is from P line. So this one's like a chain mm -hmm. swivel, where the other one's oh, a yeah. ball chain. Oh, but this one is shorter okay. than the ball chains. These the ball are the expensive ones. They are. Well, I, I have them. So the ball chains are a little bit longer, and because. Like yeah, this one, the hooks right off the back. I wanted it a little bit shorter, so I used okay. a little bit shorter chain that. Oh, but those are the two sorts of chains that I've been using. Exactly. And I'm surprised, like, it looks far back. It looks like they're not going to get the hook, like, who's doing this and why. They hook up very well. So, this uh, it comes with, with it, the chain? Or you no, no. So, the, the hook is the side wash hook. Oh, okay, so you just bend it close. Yeah, yeah. So, it's got the open eyelet on the end, and you can just. On these ones, I've been using a size six. Um, on the smaller ones and on the maglips, I'm doing a size eight. 
There's also another style of hook that I have not experimented with, uh, but uh, Japan's got an actually really big trout fishing scene, and they have uh, hooks that they use for single hook replacements for spinners and uh, jerk baits and things like that. So the big difference is one hook will be facing, uh, the eye will be facing forward, and the other one's gonna be facing this way. But uh, instead of a long shank, to a big round bend of a point. It's almost more like an octopus hook with a bigger eyelet, which I think sometimes that that roll, instead of it being a spike that drives in, right. when they close their mouth, it'll roll and pin them a little bit better. Uh, so I am looking okay. to get some of those and try those out, but I haven't experimented with them yet. I've also had, not on this river, but on another one with these sidewash hooks, because of how big the bend is, how long that point is, I took off a treble hook trying to make things nicer for the fish, and all I started doing was poking eyes. I, the, such a long shank that I was just constantly getting them, which I have not had that problem here with any fish yet. Yeah, the, this was so. This is the other chain. So uh, on the smaller baits, I've been doing. Uh, yeah. So on the smaller baits, I've been doing the shorter peat line chain, which it isn't a ball chain. Um, it's a it's a chain swivel, something you use to keep for uh, to keep from getting line twists, but it gives you that extra bit of length and it's articulated. So it still worked well, and it's a little bit shorter than those yeah. uh, bead chains are. Those have a little bit more length, so I use them for the bigger baits. Are you getting your tackle local? Does anybody have it, or are you ordering online? Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm just getting from Phil's. Phil's is an awesome Phil's place. So well, Phil's, but they've been out of a lot of stuff too lately. That's uh, where I picked up the bead chains and the sidewash hooks. Oh, okay. uh, also a lot of the plugs. Basically, when I do my shopping around here, uh, fills, I do go to Sportsman's, which I usually try not to do, but the couple of people that work there is what keeps me going back. You know, Corey's real good there. Corey, he came, Corey's, from, he Corey's, came from the fly shop. Oh, did he? Yeah. He so he's the, the only reason I go to Sportsman's. Mm -hmm. uh, Corey is awesome. He's my favorite person there. <laughs> Uh, and then the fly shop itself. There's quite a few guys over there who are actually gear slingers. Who knew? Yeah. There's a lot of bass fishermen over there throwing, you know, obnoxious baits. I, I thought they were all going to be uh, fly guys, but they're not. Okay. Uh, no. You switch out your hooks on the spinner? Uh, yes and no. If I do change them to no. a single hook, yes. So uh, are you cut your barbs off? Pitch yeah. 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 No, I'll use troubles and I'll use singles. Yeah. I've kind of been experimenting with both the series. Huh? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm sure. I'm, just, so, I'm using a lot of light drive. Yeah, all the Facebook. Yeah. 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 What what are we? And mostly. Oh, just stop coaching. I haven't had a problem yet. Yet. Uh, but so like these are some of the. No, no. Uh, so they sell different lengths of the bead chain, uh, and then the hooks are open-ended. So when you get a, a hook like this, so you just have to put that snap for it or the the uh, split ring on, and then these, so they're open. So you just flip that over and get those pliers and squeeze it fly and they're on. It's the same. It's the same. It's different color. I mean, I'm sure you've had a lot, a lot of fish flies, and I've been hooking up better because of it. But with the Maglips too, I did start doing it with this one because it's shorter. These are long and you can get in different lengths, but I have this. This would be a And you have the Maglip. So even the brown one, right there, same thing no, my no. line? Yep, even that But they just call them rubber. Uh, yeah, call them rubber. Uh, okay. So with the maglet, because the hook, uh, oh, there it is. Another nice, but when I started, I thought that sandwich was going to be a little bit more of a little bit 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 of a yeah, I've been running the three, so again, with that, if you're laying it over and kind of casting like that big wide arm cast, it works fine. See, and I've always been waiting and just getting two flies out there. Okay. And, a, and a bobber yeah. is a bitch. Yeah, it's an interesting setup. So what I want to start doing with this is actually, I've uh, been looking at a steelhead rod, 10 and a half foot or a 9.9. Mm -hmm. Same setup, having a butt is nice. When I'm have caught my nicer fish on this. It was 20 plus incher, and the biggest one I've caught has been on that thing. But you have it like this the whole time because it's got a fly handle. 
and there's nowhere to tuck it so I started trying to grab it higher it's just uncomfortable it's not the best way to do it yeah. if you get something like a steel head rod or even something like this you could see how much butt it's got just yeah. something that you could you know tuck find it put it here something a little extra to get some leverage on the fish because your forearms would be burnt or get the workout Any other questions or any other things you want to check out uh, as far as bobber stops? Or I really think these eggs are neat. <laughs> hmm. yeah, those, those RB eggs, I have caught quite a few fish on. Uh, I haven't caught any larger ones on them yet, just mid sized and smaller ones. So those are replacing the, the, the old glow bug? So I've actually run that with flies. So I've done that mm -hmm. with my last one. Um, I haven't actually thrown the glow bug at all. I just know that it's a staple around here, right. and I've been using those. I, I think it will do just about the same. When I was a kid, we, we fished with glow bugs and a, and a pencil weight, not a sleepy, mm -hmm. forever, and it was all year long. All, so I, I did notice. Because uh, when I when I first went out with you, yeah. uh, we were doing a slinky weight to a couple of flies, which caught fish. I mean, we all caught fish that day, hey. but. Um, you will catch more grass and stuff on the bottom doing it with the lead and the flies because the lead's dragging and they might be up, but a lot of times they're going to drag over the bottom and get grass on them. So the, uh, the indicator rig or the bobber rig, whatever you want to call it, something that puts it close to the bottom but it has free range to flow, it, less cleaning stuff off your hook and you're dying more bites. Uh, I've been doing a, if you have something that floats like those quirkies and drag it behind just to keep it off the bottom a little bit more, it works out pretty well, but I, it does work. I just was cleaning up stuff and I noticed the fly guys weren't. <laughs> so, yeah, you change, change it up. And I don't know if you guys uh, know the flies now. This is kind of the larger ones that I use, the attractor flies. Those are the rubber legs. They're meant to be stone flies. Um, they're indicator species, so if you've got stone flies in the river, your river's healthy. And it's a big meal for the trout. And they do eat them very well. But like I said, even if you have two, three flies on, 19 times out of 20, it's like they're eating that bottom fly. The upper sack. Those? Everywhere. I, I haven't found, that's like when I, I first started. I don't catch fish those on that lower sack. Really? But on that upper sack. No, I'll catch them. And again, it's like you said, it's my, it's my teaser. Here yeah. you go. I mean, those, uh, McLeod, upper sack, lower sack, that was the first fly that I started catching fish on, and it's always going to be in my rig. <laughs> See? Anything else while you got me, or anything else you want to check out or see? You have a cart? Do you, you, you got it all? Uh, I, well, I'm going to get my license for next year. I haven't started yet because I just moved up here this past year and I wanted to spend a year getting to know the area. So I am going to start on the river and then at some point I do want to move to some of the lakes. Because again, I'm a bass guy, but these trout, they're built different. Like these aren't your average trout. Yeah, mm -hmm. when you hook into one of these and it starts peeling, it's, it's a good feeling. Or they take off three, four feet in the air a few times, it's a good time. So, uh, I'm not, not guiding yet, uh, but uh, before next season starts we're going to be licensed bonded and all that stuff and uh, we're going to do provide the kayaks uh, which you are welcome to bring your own i would i think when i start i do want to start doing it with our kayaks first just because i know and trust the outback especially it's very stable and works very well in the river but um, that's all a part of the fee that's going to be in the guide so and hopefully i won't have that for you to use we'll get something a little bit more tiled <laughs> but, is uh in guiding on the river or just the lake no I don't think you renewed this kind of license. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did a little bit out in the Delta, but now that I'm up here, the trout's right there, it's easy, and I mean, there's plenty of, the fly guys doing it, might as well get some kayakers out there. I, I feel so bad that lived here this long and just barely scraped that river, but oh, every time I go out ridiculous. there, you catch a really nice trout. It's yeah. so And the cool thing is, they're all so varied in colors. Like, you get right. some that have zero spots, you get some that are pale, you get some that are yeah. dark, you get some that are big pointed snout, mean they, looking well, monsters. They're hybrids or something. And Man, I, it's amazing. I was told there's probably... And they fight so hard. I talked to somebody recently that uh, the, guy, the guides that are out there, like, Hundred days a year, you know, like that's their living. They catch a brown or two a year out there. So there, there used to be a lot more in there. But I don't know why they, there's not anymore. I have no idea. You'd think there'd be plenty of food for them in there. 
I have friends that have fished all over the world, and they fish here, and they're just like, good God. And it's, and it's in our backyard. backyard. Yeah. Do you, you don't go up and fish like Keswick and come down, do you? I haven't yet. Uh, no. Are you talking about right below the dam? Yeah, but I it's legal. And, I haven't and yet. Come back. There's I've heard that's. I've heard that's. Where oh the, yeah. I've heard that's where the big browns hang out. I but it's very it's rocky, right. and you better know what you're doing, especially if you're in a boat. Yeah, uh, I want to. Apparently, there is a launch that you have to like hike and roll your boat into. Yeah. So I haven't the, done it yet. My biggest problem with that is leaving your vehicle up there. That, that is, that is <laughs> the key. <laughs> That's the worst you part. Of it. Ready to up. That's I have, um, and I caught my smallest fish I've caught out of the river so far. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking to the fly guys. They were they caught five fish, and uh, one was decent. The rest of them were all tiny. I have not spent a lot of time up there. I like being able to see. You could see the seams up there, but there's just not as much going on. Uh, yeah, I, I like deeper. What's well, super and narrow deeper. there? I mean, it's yeah. only like 10, 12 feet. Not I where had, those rocks are. Where the, Way up there, it's pretty oh, deep. Okay, a, way up, a, I haven't been that far. Skinny's up. up. Um, mm -hmm. You know where the the bridge that goes across? The, yeah, we paddled up there. Okay, boats. past that and and below that, there's some real deep pockets. Right okay, there. so before the first bend, Used everything's like 12 feet. Hmm. Hmm. But uh, I haven't spent a lot of time in it. I know they're in there. It's just, you know, I like to see, like, there should be a fish there, there should be a fish there. Up there, you've got this big flat open. It's like, where do I start? Because they yeah. can be anywhere. Did you do a pedal from there? I went, yeah, I went to the bend. I didn't want to go any further. It's not hard. You can definitely do it. It just, there wasn't a lot going on. I was sitting with that indicator and just kind of drifting backwards. And there's no rapids or anything that you got to watch out for. It was too mellow. Yeah. And the fish were biting. If it was mellow and the fish were biting, it would have been great. But um, the, the fly guys were doing just from that bend and down. And like I said, I think depending on the time of year, if the bite's good or not, a, a lot of the stuff, especially even when I talk to the fly guys, when the hatches are happening and the fish are feeding, they're kind of eating everything good, whether you're th doing the plugs, the flies, whatever. If they're feeding, they're feeding. If the hatches start uh, tapering off, there's not as much natural food in the water. They're not as aggressive or eating as much food. So the bite significantly slows down. Uh, when the water started dropping and I was talking to all the fly guys, it went from getting six, eight bites a day in my float, just plugging, um, to two or three maybe. And I started to ask people, like, what's your experience? Are you guys having to slow down? Like, what's going on? And that's what they said is like, there hasn't been as many hatches. So the fish aren't as aggressively feeding and We've had slower time too, so you know it's all all revolves around the bait. And in the river, the majority of the bait is fl uh, flies and eggs, caddis, stoneflies, lots and lots of caddis. Lots of caddis. Lots of caddis. Upper stack right now, pretty soon, probably another two weeks. The that October caddis hatch will hit. Okay. That's, that's amazing. Oh, I'm sure. How about flow rates? Flow rates? Yeah. Um, I haven't looked. I just kind of go out. Well, and nothing's I mean, looked dangerous. Is there anything yet. that's better or a uh, flow rate that's like, hey, we're not going out. It's too fast. So I haven't found a flow rate that I'm not going out on. I was having better success with the plugs with higher flow, higher water. Right. Um, just because they weren't hitting the bottom, and I, I think there's more water going down, so it keeps your plug a little bit more mm. active. As as the water tapered off, I just kind of changed tactics. The bite didn't get better or worse. You just have to change up what you're doing. But I think the plugs are super fun because, like I said, when they hit it, they hit it with bad intention. They just whack, and yeah. you start screaming down the river, and it's great. <laughs> the plugs are fun. And you don't have to do much. You can literally sit there with your beverage, pedal backwards, rod and rod holder, just kind of keep it in the seam. You just mellow go down the river watch the sunset uh, i do find middle of the day is not the time i've been out there quite a few times middle of the day let's say like one to four or like noon to four in that area the bite starts picking up i'd say like three four and after and uh before noon one o'clock and it's been pretty drastically obvious like i'll go out there in the middle of the day I might get a bite, more often than not, no bites. And so you slip into one of the little ponds off the river and catch bass. But uh, morning, evening for the trout, it's almost essential. It, it was dead in the middle of the day. And you don't have to be out there butt crack of dawn either because uh, the hatches need uh, heat. 
so the bugs don't start emerging until the sun's out and the water starts warming up a little bit. So there's no three, four o'clock in the morning that you need to do. I'll yeah. get out there <laughs> seven o'clock, eight o'clock, catch plenty of fish. Timmy, you still gotta get through three to get set up. What? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, that's that pretty much it. I hope uh, hope you guys all get out on the river and hopefully this has been informational, catch you a few more fish because I mean, when I started, I started catching nothing or a bite here and there, and as I kind of did my research, talked to people, and started changing things around, I've definitely caught my fair share, and I've only been here for a year. You guys live here, take advantage of it. I mean, it's fantastic. Great presentation, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Matt. I picked up a couple of these.